right, happy Sabbath again, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy, 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 happy Sabbath. I know you had a wonderful lunch. Yes. I know. Okay, good evening again, everyone. We want to welcome you back to uh, the evening segment of the yes. day's program. Whether you are joining us from Hope SDA, Sandy Park SDA, Gordon Town SDA, Goldsmith Villa SDA, August Town SDA, or Bedward Gardens SDA, I want to welcome you to the evening's program. And we just want to say thank you for joining us. It's not too late to grab that link and to share it with some of your friends and family. And just to remind the persons that the children will go to the children's tent after devotion and then the adults will remain for Bible class. Bible class. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We turn our God and our Father for the blessings of the Sabbath day we give you thanks. As we dive now into your words, may your spirit be your master teacher. For we ask in Jesus' name, let the church say, Amen. Amen. We'll share in some amen. songs at this time before we head into our Bible class segment. Good afternoon, everyone. To start off our song service, we'll sing hymn number 522, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
Good and 86, Wonderful Words of Life. and 72 give me the bible Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's good to see those of us who are here, and we praise the Lord for you uh, being here this evening. And of course, we still want to appeal to you that we're looking forward to you not only coming on Sabbath mornings, but we're hoping and trusting and want to encourage you to come in the night. Amen. And uh, bring a friend with you. Take somebody with you. Don't come alone. Amen? Don't come alone. So we want to encourage you. Uh, come on Sabbath. And of course, not only on Sabbath, but come in the week 
and bring a friend with you. Take somebody with you as we share together because we are here to share the love of Jesus together. Amen? And we are here to tell others about where we can find Jesus. Amen? Let us pray as we get ready to begin our Bible class. Let us pray. All right, just before we do that, Bible workers, we want to encourage you to meet at the back, at the back with Pastor Smith and uh, uh, Pastor Junior. So Bible workers, you are invited to a meeting at the back. All right, we're going to go quickly. Let us pray. Let us pray. Mighty God, our Holy Father, we thank you for the blessings of today. We ask now you bless us as we go into this Bible class. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we wanted a family focus for our crusade. And this evening we'll be looking at a simple topic, and we have just 20 minutes to go through it. All right, so we invite you to participate with us and to share together. It's not monologue, but all of us will be sharing together. Amen? We'll be sharing together. So this afternoon we're talking about building what? Resilient families. That's what we're talking about. Uh, we believe that God loves family. Amen, somebody? Amen? And all of us are here because of a family. Amen? We didn't come about by ourselves. We, father and our mothers came together. And of course, as a result of that, we are here. We came together because God made Adam. Amen? And God made Eve. Amen? He didn't make Adam and Steve, amen, but he made Adam and Eve, and as a result, because of that union, uh, we are here today, and God said to Adam and Eve, they, they were to be faithful and multiply, amen, they were to be faithful and multiply and fill the earth, amen, somebody, yes, man, that was God's plan, and so God's plan was that in all of society, you would have Christian families. Amen? Because the devil, God knows the devil would be out there and the devil would, would corrupt man and would cause some people to develop and to grow into the world who would cause shame and who would cause sin. Amen? And who would destroy the world. But God wanted to make sure that there were people who would love him still. Amen? And people who would carry on a generation of Christians. And many of us are here because our families were Christians. Amen? And so it made it a little easier for us to become Christians. And so that is God's plan, that we have, that we have a generation of spiritual people. Amen? So next thing we want to look at is resilient, uh, seven principles for family resilience. That's what we want to look at this evening for the next 15 minutes or so, seven principles for resilient families. Uh, when it comes on to Beautiful. So very nice. So we wanted to do it on PowerPoint. So we have seven principles for family resilience. And that's what we want to look at this evening. Uh, how we can keep our families together by God's grace. Amen? All right. So we're going to be looking at the first one. The first one, oh, it's so small. You can't see it. So I feel it's a little bigger. But the first one, anybody can see it? All right, the first one is appreciation. Amen? And it's Bible class, so we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about it. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, and verse what? Philippians chapter 4, and verse 8. Philippians 4, maybe we need a mic to 
we passed around. We want to we want the audience to participate. So if somebody's here with a mic, we can um somebody wants to read the scripture. We have somebody at the back. All right, the mic is there. Anybody has found it? Philippians four verse eight. At the front here. Raise your hand so they can see you. All right, see somebody there. All right, go to the front. Go to the front. Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Philippians chapter four, verse eight, and it says, "Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely." Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, any praise, think on these things. Amen. Amen, brethren. So the first thing we have is what? All right. The first thing is appreciation. And we're saying that the Bible encourages us. That we are to focus on whatsoever things are lovely. Amen? Whatsoever things are pure. Amen? Amen? And we are to think on these things. Very often sometimes as, as human beings, we tend to focus on the negative. Is it true, brethren? We tend to focus on the negative about each other, about our children. We talk about what the children are not doing and where they don't, you know, the, the bad things that they're doing. We don't talk about the good things that they're doing. And the same thing goes for us with parents and so forth. Sometimes children talk only negative about their parents. Nothing good to say. Yes? And sometimes it happens even with, with other family members, spouse, husband and wife and, you know, auntie and uncle and so forth. We tend to talk about only the negative. But the Bible is here encouraging, uh, encouraging us to speak about the positive. Amen? To think on the positive. Amen? To focus on the positive. That's what the Bible is saying. And when we focus on the positive, we will appreciate each other. Amen? So we want to appreciate each other for the good things that we do. Amen? Sometimes we have too much negative in the world. We don't need more of that in the church. Uh, sometimes as brethren, uh, believers, we tend to focus on the negative of our fellow brethren. We talk about the, the bad things that they're doing, and we're not talking about the good things, right? So the first thing we want to do is, as believers, we want to focus on things that are positive. Amen? And if we focus on things that are positive, it will help us to be happier. Amen? Uh, Pastor Smith is talking about the keys to happiness. If we focus on things that are positive, it will help us to be positive. Amen? And we will sleep better at night because our minds are not constantly thinking of negative things about each other, but we're thinking of the positive. And so the word of God encourages us as believers to think on whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are honest. And if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, we must think on these things. Amen? Not only must we think on them, but we must say them. Amen, brethren? Amen, brethren? Yes, man. Somebody sing a song. Appreciate the person. Say, well, you did well. Somebody, you know, help to clean the church and so forth. Say, yes, man. We appreciate what you're doing. Amen? Our technical team, all of these people, we want to appreciate our loved ones. Amen? And by appreciating and by speaking more of the positive, we will have healthier, happy families. Amen? And so the next thing we want to look at is spending time together. It's hard to see. But what we're saying, time to what? Spending time what? Together. Spending time what? Together. And so we need to spend time together as, as a family. Amen? And so we come to church together. Amen, brethren? very important that we come together to church. Sometimes some people don't want to come to church, but I want to encourage you. You have some family members. You have your uncle and your aunt, and, and, and they're not coming to church. Uh, spend time together at church. Invite them to come to church and spend time together at church. Amen, brethren? Yes, man. Spend time together. 
even a church is, is, is a place for us to spend time together and let us worship the Lord together. So we need to spend time what? Together. We need to carve out time. Sometimes we get so busy. We don't check the children homework and so forth because we're so busy. You know, but we need to find a way of spending time together, eating together. Amen? Yes, man. At least once a week, we must can find some time where we can come together as a family and we can eat together. Amen? Amen, brethren? Yes, man. We're talking about uh, spending time together. Some people believe that the only time we can spend together is when we're doing something big. But even small things like these go a far away uh, in terms of building our families. We want to ensure that we spend time together. So Solomon uh, 6, verse 1 to 3, uh, we want to look at the scripture. We're talking about Bible class. Solomon 6, verses 1 to 3. Somebody can find it. Solomon chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Anybody has found it? All right, there's a hand here, the mic, come raise your hand, oh, probably need to stand so they can see you. Uh, whither is thy Just stand and read it for us, thank you. <coughs> whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? My beloved is gone down into his garden to the bed of spices, to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Amen. So a family is like a garden. Amen? A family is like a what? Garden. And just like how the garden needs nurturing, we have to water the plants. Amen? If we don't water the plants, what will happen to the plants? They will die. Right? So we have to spend time with the plants. Yes? And I think it was Dr. Smith who said it uh, the other night that even plants respond to positive energy and positive talk. Yes? So as a family, as families, we need to spend time together, spend time talking together, uh, sharing together, and attending to important family matters. That is very important. Amen? And so just like how we need to nurture the garden, we need to water the plants. We need to trim the plants. So it is with our families. We need to check on our families. What is happening? How is the family? And so forth. Amen? All right. We're going to move on quickly to the next one. And I'm going to wrap up very quickly so that we can have the AY program. We don't want to overload you. Give you just enough. So the next one that we're looking at is what? You're supposed to can see that one. Family what? Very important. Would you agree? Would you agree? And, and before I go to family spirituality, let me ask some feedback. How else can we spend time together as families? Let me hear some suggestions from the audience. What can we do to spend time together? Somebody can stand and, and, and say a point. If you stand, stand up. Give her a mic. Give her a mic. Give her a mic. And if you have a point to make, just stand up. And let us all benefit together. I think we can take some trips, family vacation. Yes. And trips sometimes. You know? Very good. So one way we can spend time together is taking what? Come on, Bridget. What what can we do? Vacation trips together. There's a hand over here. Sometimes person believe that you have to have a lot of money to spend with your time with your family. Yes. But even with my family, when my children were small, I always tell persons, I didn't have any money. But in the, the dinner that we cook on a Sunday, we just go over to the campus there. We spread out and we have our dinners. We go for walks and mango time and guinea time and we all over the place. And I, for me, I was, for myself, I was apologizing to my children because I was so poor that I couldn't take them for ice cream and so but now I hear my children boasting about those days when mommy used to take them out and picnic. We go to the pack our food and go to Port Royal and spread out our blankets. And we have our meals and everything. So no persons are saying, people have cars, now can go places, but they're not going anywhere with a family. 
So I usually enjoy the summer and Sundays. Almost every Sunday evening, we are on the road somewhere. Hope Gardens, anywhere. We just pack up our food and carry blankets and balls, and we just spread out. Anywhere we go, it was our game area. So you don't have to have time, money to... The same food that you cook instead of going out to buy a burger, you cook the food at home, pack up the rice and peas and whatever everybody eat, and spread it out. And my children always say, Mommy, you trick us because when you put the food in the plate and give us, we don't get it. To, but when you put it out and we share for ourselves, we find that we get, we don't eat as much, you know, so they have it to eat at their heart's content. And after, but they were so anxious to go and play. So they didn't have time to take out enough you know, food to eat. So we can spend time in different areas. We don't have to have to go if we don't if we can't go on a vacation. We have a lot of places, hope gardens and anywhere. Just have a picnic. Even at home, my grandson used to say, Grandma, let us have a picnic. I said, we, uh, I said, okay, we just put a table outside and put the food on the table outside. And it was a picnic for them. Uh, you know, so there are little things we can do to help our family. So, especially when you have small children, put the food outside on a table and let them have a picnic and they serve themselves. And they, as far as they're concerned, it's a picnic. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. There's a hand over there at the back. Amen. Beautiful. So we're seeing that we don't have to have money to spend time together. Amen. Amen, brethren. Amen. So I'm not saying amen to that one. We want big money. But... A little goes a far away. Amen. Thanks. Happy Sabbath, everyone. So, um, I don't know who don't like a good story, but sometimes I don't know who realize that this might be a good way of spending time together. I remember when I was younger, um, of course, I wasn't like in a father figure role, but I was a, a bigger um, teen. And I used to sit and tell... Um, my other siblings, and some other youths that used to come to my home um, to chill and stuff. I treat them like brothers. I used to tell them stories. And, y y you know, stories can be a, a means of ministry. You know, we can sit and tell our children about things that we have been through. It can be a testimony session. And you find to know how much they are interested, how much they will learn, because a lot of times they themselves are going through some of the things that you would have gone through and overcome but because we don't sit and talk to them, we don't tell them stories about our past, they end up having to redo the cycle and ending up having to be hurt um, with things that you could have prevented had you, for example, sit them down and tell them about some past things. And it's a time to minister as well. Beautiful, beautiful point and uh, stories. All right, so we're going to go quickly now. So family spirituality, there's a hand. All right, quickly, do that last hand, and then we move on to family spirituality. And we have a few more, and we will finish. Another way that we can spend time with each other is just playing games. You just come together in the house, you sit and you play games. You can grab the hymnals and learn songs together, especially the hymnals that, that has the music on it, can teach you the, the tune to the song. You come together and you, you learn it together. You read the Bible together, you study, you quote it together. There are so many ways, and, and all the other ways that the other persons had um, pointed out is what I had in mind. So all those ways we can spend time with each other. Beautiful. So playing games together. Amen, brethren? That's wonderful. So not only the family that prays together, but the family that plays together stays together. Amen? So it's good when we can play together as a family, and it makes a difference. Amen? Children will love it, and everybody will love it. Amen? So it's good to, to play together as a family. But we're looking at family spirituality. All right. So... It's simply speaking about our devotional life as families, as individuals. It means, therefore, that we have to find time for devotion. Amen? Amen, brethren? Yes, man. At least once a week. It should be every day. Yes? Every day we should read our Bibles. Every day we should pray. Amen? But at least once a week, you must come together as a family and have family worship. Sometimes it's difficult because we have people who are not Adventists and they don't want to come and so forth. But you can't force people, but we should encourage it. Amen? Amen? We should encourage it. 
and encourage the fact that we should uh, pray together. Pray together. Yes? Ellen White says in the book, My Life Today, page 29, family worship should never be neglected, and our homes should be a little church on earth. Amen? So we should spend time together in family worship. I remember as a little child, as a little boy, my family, we would go by my grandfather's house on a Friday night. And I would look forward to it. It's, it's interesting. As little kids, we, as little boys, we look forward to it. Going there on a Friday night to have worship. It was the best thing ever. My grandfather taught us the scriptures. And we had to learn them. And we look forward to it. Going together on a Friday night to have worship. And so it's a good thing. And we should encourage it in our homes. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. What does the Bible say? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Pray without what? So we need to pray together as a family. Amen? We should always be praying individually. But it's good and we can pray together as a family. Not only when problems reach, but even without problems. Amen, brethren? You know, when problems reach, everybody say, yeah, man, let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. We, we need to pray. But when we don't have any problem, we must still pray. Amen, brethren? So let us pray without what? In the good times and the bad times. Pray without what? All right. Next thing uh, is effective communication. And what? Come on. Read it on the screen. Effective what? And what? So at times in our homes, we will have conflict. Can I hear you say amen? You need to say amen because it is true. No matter which family, no matter how spiritual the family is, no matter how godly the family is, no matter how much you go to church and worship and pray, at times we will have what? Conflict. Amen? Because there is no perfect family. Amen? Amen? And not here in the church, say amen. amen. We, don't, we have not reached there yet. We're still getting there as, as people. And there is no perfect family because there's no perfect person. And if we are not perfect, our families cannot be perfect. Everybody with me? And so we will have conflict at time. And so what we need to do is to learn how to manage the conflict that we have. That is what we need to learn how to do. Manage the conflict that we have. And so we have a few scriptures that we're going to use to, to share with us uh, some principles that we can use to manage our conflict. So uh, first thing I want to say to you is that family members should let each other know our thoughts and feelings. Amen? Everybody with me? So we must speak our mind. Everybody with me? We need to speak what is on our heart. If we don't speak it, it's going to fester and cause problems. And we wonder why we're malice in each other. And, and nobody can understand when you, you're not talking. Everybody with me? Because nobody can read your mind. Everybody with me? You can read my mind. I can read your mind. So we have to express our thoughts and what? Feelings. We have to express our what? Thoughts and what? So in order for there to be good communication in the families, we must express our what? Thoughts and what? Now let us look at the guiding principles for that. Uh, Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. Colossians 4 and verse 6. And then somebody will look at Proverbs 25, verse 11. But let's deal with Colossians 4, verse 6. Anybody has found it? All right, the hand is here. Where's the man with the mic? Stand up, please, so you can identify you. Stand up if you... If you stand up, stand up, so you can identify you with not seeing the hands. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. So let your speech be what? 
seasoned with what? Salt. So while we're going to be expressing ourselves and telling our thoughts and our feelings, we must first what? Season it with what? Salt. We must have grace. Amen? So before we express ourselves and before we tell our thought and our feeling, the first thing we want to do is add a little salt to it. Amen? Put a little seasoning in it. Make a little flavor so that we don't just say what we want to say and just hurt each other. But we say it in love. Amen? Amen? We say it with, with, with kind words. Amen? And we say it with affection and care. So we need to season our words. Amen? Uh, Proverbs 25 verse 11. Let's look at something else that we need to do. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 11. Then somebody else will find James 1 verse 19. Proverbs chapter 25 Verse 11. Um, Stand and read it for us, please. Verse 11. Yes. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. A word what? Fitly spoken. So we want to say a nice word. A word fitly spoken, right? So we want to say it, and we need to say it, but we need to season it. Amen, somebody? And it makes the world of a difference because what it does is that we're able to understand each other better. Amen? I'm able to understand what is happening with you and you're able to understand what is happening with me. Uh, James 1 verse 19. James 1 verse 19. James 1 verse 19. Somebody has found it? Somebody has found it? Just stand so our mic man can come to you. James 1 verse 19. James chapter 1 verse 19 and it reads, Wherefore, my beloved virgin, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to rot. So what, what, what must we do? Come read it again, read it again. Let every man be swift to hear. So wait. The first thing we must do is what? Swift Listen. to hear. Swift to hear. So the first thing we should do is swift to what? Hear. hear. So we must listen before we speak. Amen? Amen. Everybody with me? Amen. Swift to hear. What else? Slow to speak. So before I speak, I must what? Listen. Slow to speak. What else? Slow to what? So if we follow that principle, we should be all right. Amen? So a lot of us, we do it the other way around. We swift to anger. Everybody with me? We get angry and we don't know what. We're just upset and we upset and we upset. And, and then we're quickly speaking. Yes? And then we're listening last. Everybody with me? But the Bible says to have effective communication, we must be swift to what? Hear. Slow to what? Speak. And then what? Slow to wrath. And then there's a principle with, when it comes on to wrath, where the word of God says that we must be angry and sin not. Amen? So we can get angry. At times we will, we will get angry, but we must not sin in it. Amen? So we speak our minds. We try. And, and this is where we need God's Holy Spirit to help us. Because sometimes we have anger issues and support. I'm not able to fully control it, but we need God to help us. Amen? So we need to pray and ask God to give us the strength, give us the wisdom before we speak. So that we speak in love and we allow him to subdue our anger. Amen? All right. So we're going to move quickly now. And uh, we have the next one we have is, you're not able to see it, is intimacy. Intimacy. All right. So we're talking about intimacy Basically, three forms of intimacy. There's the intellectual intimacy where we connect intellectually. We're able to share with each other. We're able to talk to each other. And uh, we are able to communicate at that level. Then there is also the spiritual intimacy where we come to church together. We pray together. We fellowship together in, in spiritual things. Uh, we discuss the word of God together. And so what is happening is that we're having spiritual intimacy. Amen. And then, of course, there's a physical intimacy. 
and we need all three. Amen? All right. So husbands and wives must be best friends, and we must have love one for the other. Amen? We must love each other. Amen, brethren? We must what? Love each other. Care for each other. Uh, as families. As, uh, and of course, we are part of the family of God. Amen? Uh, Solomon 4 verse 10 speaks about it. Uh, you can go to it quickly. I have a few minutes left, and I have two more slides, and we will end. All right? Solomon, anybody want to read that one quickly, and then we move on? Solomon 4 verse 10. Anybody has found it? Quickly. And we're going to move to the next one. Solomon 4, verse 10. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Amen. So that is words again. So even words of affirmation, words of love, make a difference with our intimacy. Amen, brethren? Amen, brethren? Yes, man. So we must speak lovely to each other, speak nice words. Listen to that. Amen? Isn't that lovely? Isn't that lovely? And that is how we must speak to each other because we need it as families. I don't believe that anybody is tough. We all need it. Amen? Women need it. Men need it. Children need loving words. It helps us in our intimacy. All right. Lastly, well, second to last, we have our, our financial what? Stability. Financial what? Stability. So we're talking about the principles for building uh, Effective families, family resilience, uh, financial stability. We must not love money more than God. Amen? We must love God first. Amen? And we mustn't love money. That's what the Bible says. We mustn't love. The love of money is the root of all evil. But we need money. Amen, brethren? We need what? We need money for the campaign. Everybody with me? It's a big budget just to keep this program going. Uh, you know, the whole setup, everything, and uh, Bible workers, buses in the nights. We need what? We need what? Money. So if anybody tell you that they don't need money, it's foolish as they're talking about. Everybody with me? Because we need what? Come on. We need what? We need what? We need what? We need what? We need money. And so we need money here at the tent, so you need money in your family. Everybody with me? Yes, man, we need money to ensure that we have good families and to take care of each other. Everybody with me? Yes, man. So let's look at a few scriptures quickly. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Somebody will find 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Somebody else will find uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. Anybody has found it? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse what? Verse 10. Somebody's found it right at the front here. Somebody else will look for Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Amen. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Amen. Fight the good fight. Amen. So we must love money. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. Let me see here. And somebody else will find Proverbs 6, verse 11. Let me find that one quickly. Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 11. Let me see it quickly. Anybody has found it? Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. 19. Is, sorry. A feast is made for laughter, and wine make it merry, but money answereth all things. All right, money answered all things. Uh, Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 11. Proverbs 6, verses what? 6 to 11. And then let me see, Leviticus 27. Let me see if I can find that one quickly. All right. Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, 
consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provided her meat in the summer and gathered her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? Wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travail it, and thy want as an armed man. Amen. So if we're not working, and if we're not trying to work, then what will happen is that we will, we will become poor. All right? So God wants us to work. We mustn't be uh, sluggard. All right? And of course, the Bible also says that we must provide for our families. Amen? And the Word of God says if anyone does not provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. Amen? So that is speaking to the husbands and the fathers. Your responsibility is to provide for your family. And if you are a single parent family and you don't have any husband or, or so, you should still provide for yourself. Amen? And for your children. Amen, brethren? All right. Lastly, is last thing that we have here is family what? Family what? Family what? On this side, family what? Family what? Family what? Family what? Family commitment. All right? Family is, we must be committed to each other. Amen, brethren? We are a family. And, and from you have a child that will always be your child. Amen? And from you have a parent that will always be your parent, no matter what happens. So God wants us to be committed to each other. Amen? Amen, brethren? Amen. Yes, man. He, that is God's plan, uh, that we would be committed to each other and that we would prioritize first, God first, and then, of course, our families next. Amen? Families next. Uh, one of the things that we find, well, let me use a scripture. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. A number of scriptures, but I have two minutes left. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. First Corinthians, anybody has found it? First Corinthians seven, verse thirty-nine. Proverbs seven. First Corinthians seven and verse thirty-nine. It says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. If her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Amen. Only in the Lord. Amen, brethren. So God is saying we are bound to each other. Amen. And that is God's ideal for his family, that we be bound to each other until death. Do we what? Do we part? That is what God's word says. And of course, let me read this one quickly in the interest of time. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 6. Children are, children's children are the crown of old men. And the glory of children are their fathers. So God wants us to love each other. Amen. And to be committed to each other. And to take care of each other. Amen. To be committed. So even when you would have grown as a child and you're out of your family's home, out of your parents' home, you should still love your parents. Amen. And still care for them. And of course, uh, look after them. Because it is God's plan that we look after each other. Amen? And lastly, we have the family of God. We're closing right now, and we have the family of God. So if you're not, you don't have any family members around now, you can be a member of the family of God. Amen? You can be a member of what? Of the family of God. And God wants us to be part of his family because he's coming back for his family. Amen? Amen? Mark 6, verse 16. How can you become a part of the family of God? Mark chapter 6, verse 16. Somebody read that one quickly. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 16. And uh, somebody has found it. 
Mark chapter 6, verse 16. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is ridden, risen from the dead. It is Mark. Mark 6, verse 16. Mark 6, verse 16. That is it? All right. So I, all right. Well, let me share with you lastly, 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is what? He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all. What? Unrighteousness. So we can become part of the family of God. And all we need to know is that God has a family. Amen? And he's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for all those who love him. Amen? And if we give our lives to him, the Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized, the same shall be what? Shall be saved. Anybody want to be a part of the family of God? Amen? When the family on earth unites with the family in heaven, oh, what a day that will be. Amen? When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who what? saves me by his grace. So as I close, as I close, seven principles for resilient families. The first one is, of course, appreciation. Amen? Let us love each other. Say nice words to each other. Number two, spend time together. Amen? Spend time together. Number three, family spirituality. We must have a devotion together. Amen? Of course, we must have effective communication. Amen? Communicate effectively by using the good words, nice words, affectionate words, and seasoning the words with salt. Intimacy. We must share together. We must express ourselves to each other. Amen. We must have family worship. Number six, financial stability. We must work and put the money together. Amen. And make the family work. Praise God. And number seven, we must be committed to each other. Amen. May God help us to have good families. Let us stand as we pray, as we turn over to our AY department. Let us stand as we close off with, with uh, Bible class. Let us stand. Let us pray. Mighty God, our Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us as families. Different individuals, we are here. We praise your name, Lord, that you have blessed us. You have given us uh, parents. You have given us siblings. You have given us spouse, husband, and so forth. You have given us all things, and we praise and magnify your name. You have given us children. We thank you, Lord. May you bless our families, bless our homes, and keep our families together. Of course, Lord, there are others who have not yet become a part of the family of God. We pray in a special way, dear God, that you will draw them to your side. You will use us, Lord to reach our family members who have not yet said yes to Jesus. Some used to walk with you, but they have strayed. We pray, O oh God, that you will use us to bring them back. And may we be part of the family of God, so that one day when you come in glory and power to call your people home, may we all be ready to hail you as our Lord and personal Savior from sin and to hear from your lips, well done. Good and faithful servants, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again, in one accord. Something good is going to happen, something good is in store. We are together again, just praising the Lord. One more time. We are together again. Yeah.
upon Jesus, Jesus name so sweet. Every rock we rock upon Jesus, Jesus name so sweet. Won't it be a time when we get over yonder? Won't it be a time when we get over yonder? Won't it be a time when we get over yonder? Oh, won't it be a time? We're gonna sing and shout, dance about when we get over yonder. Sing and shout, dance about when we get over yonder. Sing and shout, dance about when we get over yonder. Oh, won't it be a time? I've got my mind made up. I've got my mind made up, and I won't. I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus someday. One more time. I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up, and I won't. Goodbye world, I'll stay no longer with you. Goodbye pleasures of sin, I'll stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. One more time, goodbye world, goodbye world. I'll stay no longer with you. Goodbye pleasures of sin, I'll stay no longer with you, I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. So we sing amen. 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 And all the ladies sing. Come on, ladies. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so at this time, I'm going to ask everyone to stand as we go through the youth ideas. And we're asking you to stand at attention. Comments with our AYM, the Advent message, the AY motto, and the AY pledge.
Loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the work of the youth minister of the church, doing what I can to help others. The AY law. AY law is for me to keep the morning watch, do my honest part, care for my body, be courteous and obedient, walk softly in the sanctuary, keep a song in my heart, go on God's errands. And we take the song. The weave for Maryland and sea, together we pray and work and play in a behold. message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth, Adventist youth. You may be seated. All right, so... Each AY program, we'll be having our morning watch. Let me see the hands of those who still do morning watch in their church. Ah, the hands are few. All right. But here, you're going to get back into the habit of morning watch. And I want you to listen carefully now because we're going to be changing the grouping of the churches each week. We have six churches, and each week we're going to mix two different churches together. We're going to try to show you where to sit when you come, and so you can be seated together. So for week one, which is next week, the grouping that we have for next week, and you can take a note of this, Bedward Garden and Hope. So for next week, we'll have one group being Bedward Garden and Hope, August Town and Sandy Park, and Goldsmith Villa and Garden Town. Is, is why that sweet somebody, so? It's going to change by the following week, not to worry. All right, so we got that. Bedward Garden and Hope, August Town and Sandy Park, and Goldsmith Villa and Garden Town. So that is week one, which is next week. Now for Bedward Garden and Hope, the morning watch text that you will be required to study, which I'm going to give you shortly, is Sunday and Monday and Sabbath. So Sunday, Monday, and Sabbath. August Town and Sunday Park, you will have Tuesday and Wednesday and Sabbath. Goldsmith Villa and Gordon Town, you will have Thursday and Friday and Sabbath. So we got that? All right, great. Now on to giving you the text that you will need to study. So for the church that has Sunday and Monday, you ready? <clears throat> All right, I don't know why this is showing March as having 30 days, but Sunday is the 31st. But let's work it out. So we'll do March 30 and April 1 for Sunday and Monday, okay? <clears throat> so for the person that has Sunday and Monday, it's Deuteronomy 15, verse 11. And for Monday, it is Psalm 56, verse 4. For Tuesday, it's 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Wednesday, Matthew 7, verse 24. So that's Matthew 7, verse 24. Thursday, on Thursday. 
Okay, all right. All right, so Sunday is Deuteronomy 15, verse 11. Monday is Psalm 56, verse 4. Tuesday is 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Tuesday, Matthew 7, verse 24. Wednesday, Romans 1, verse 17. Thursday, sorry, this is Friday. Psalm 18, verse 35. And then Sabbath is Luke 11, verse 28. Did everybody get that? No? So you have Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, being the first text, which is Sunday. Monday is Psalm 56, verse 4. Tuesday is 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Wednesday is Matthew 7, verse 24. Thursday is Romans 1, verse 27. Friday is Psalm 18, verse 35. And Sabbath, which everybody is going to study, is Luke 11, verse 28. Got it now? Okay. Anybody wanted to write it and did not get it? Pardon? Thursday? All right. Thursday is Romans 1, verse 17. But please remember that you're studying them according to your grouping and the text that was assigned. Pardon? Thursday is Romans 1, verse 7. Sorry, that's Friday. Thursday, sorry. Romans 1, verse 17. <clears throat> so Thursday, Romans 1, verse 17. And I'm just going to repeat the groupings for next week. Bedward Garden and Hope. You will have Sunday and Monday. Augustown and Sandy Park. You will have Tuesday and Wednesday, Goldsmith Villa and Gordon Town. You will have Thursday and Friday, and everyone will study the text for Sabbath. All right? And please, you know, we might just have some little tokens. We might have the church of the series, you know, because we'll be observing the persons who are repeating their morning watch, how consistent you are and all of that. So come prepared and come ready to repeat your morning watch text next week. Happy Sabbath, everyone. All right, everyone except Abel. Happy Sabbath. We are still in Sabbath. I don't understand how we are at our first Sabbath to the Keys to Happiness campaign, and everybody's not happy. You're not happy anymore? Where did the happiness go? Only Abel is happy. Abel, I can feel that you're happy. I can feel that Shakara is happy. Everybody else, are we happy? We are at our first AOI for the Keys to Happiness campaign. And how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm feeling, feeling happy. good. That's good. And we have a wonderful program lined up. And it is a very informative and relevant program this afternoon. So I implore you, I urge you to pay attention, to listen keenly so that we can have a wonderful discussion after our little presentation here because the discussion is where we all take part. And just as we had a wonderful discussion this morning, 
That's what I expect, you know, a wonderful discussion because I, I know that the Adventist Church, we have intellectuals, we have brilliant minds, and we, we are here to share, right? Exchange? Exchange of knowledge? I'm not convinced, but we'll work on it. So welcome to our first AY, and I hope that you gain a blessing from this afternoon's proceeding. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Please stand for the opening hymn, hymn 388, Don't Forget the Sabbath. That is hymn 388. Please stand. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day. 
if the Sabbath should be kept on Saturday, what biblical evidence exists? Look at this courtroom drama as it unfolds with a dialogue between defendant and persecution, going head to head on what the Bible says about which day should be kept. The aim of this program is to show the church biblical evidence for keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Hear ye, hear ye. The Seventh day Adventist AY Society Superior Court is now in, now in session. The Honorable Judge presiding. All rise. Before we begin, I will ask the court deputy sheriff to administer the oath to the jurors. Jurors, please raise your right hand with me. Juror, jurors, do you promise that the evidence that you shall, that the answers that you, you shall give before this court of all your qualifications to act as jurors in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So if you're good. Jurors, it is your duty to weigh the evidence to stand on the truth, the side of truth, to give a verdict. You may sit. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this case, file number seven, of the state versus the Seventh Day Adventist young people, states that in defense, the man has breached God's intention for the Sabbath. The young people also informed the court that they can prove from the Bible that the seven-day Sabbath was before Mount Sinai and that the Sabbath is still binding. Imagine this Sabbath. Sabbath? What is that? They never, that was from a long, long time ago. They never heard that the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. Where even is the proof that Sabbath was kept before the decree of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai? <laughs> Order. Order in the court. We will take a five-minute recess. Happy Sabbath Church. I'll read in your hearing. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us, today, bringing us here today. Be with the proceedings now. Amen. Amen. 
This court session now resumes. The prosecutor and defense counsel will now move to make their opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today we find ourselves at a pivotal moment in the annals of religious history, where the sacred traditions of old stand in stark contrast to the winds of change we are proposing. As we embark on this journey of truth seeking, let us not be swayed by the melodious tones of rhetoric, but instead, let us grasp firmly onto the pillars of reason and unwavering faith. The defense would have you believe that the sanctity of the Sabbath, a cornerstone of religious observance, was merely a casualty in the march of progress. But we assert that the apostles in Matthew 16, verse 19, entrusted with the divine authority of our Lord himself, changed the day of worship in a favor of a new tradition. Should we infer that the disciples, subsequent to receiving the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the first day of the week, the day of Pentecost, according to Acts 2, verses 1 to 8, did not view this symbolic act as an indicate, indication to shift the day of worship to the first day of the week? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 2 argues that the apostles rejected the Sabbath to avoid the risk of mingling Judaism and Christianity, a bold assertion that resonates with the tensions of the time. In the crucible of religious discourse, where ancient traditions clashed with the burgeoning faith of Christianity, such a decision may have seemed necessary to forge a distinct identity. Furthermore, the prosecution points to the significance of the first day of the week, the day on which our Savior rose from the dead. He revealed himself to his followers, John 20, verses 1 to 18. Christ's resurrection, heralded by his appearances to his disciples, stands as a cornerstone of our faith, a beacon of hope illuminating to path, the path to salvation. Moreover, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, an event of unparalleled spiritual significance, occurred on a Sunday, further cementing the sanctity of this day in the annals of religious history. In conclusion, the prosecution proposed that the Sabbath was indeed changed, not as an act of defiance or disregard for tradition, but as a reflection of the divine will and transformative, transformative power of faith. It is our fervent hope that you, esteemed members of the jury, will weigh this evidence with the gravity it deserves and render a verdict that resonates with the truths revealed to us through the ages. Ladies of the jury, I am clearly standing by the word of God. We have God's law proclaimed in Exodus 20. Exodus is a book of law. The Sabbath was binding in Eden and it has existed ever since. This fourth commandment begins with the word remember, showing that the Sabbath already existed when God wrote the law on the table of stone at Sinai. How can men claim that this one commandment has been done away with when they will admit that the other nine are still binding? According to the 16th chapter of Exodus, when Israel was relieved from the slavery in Egypt, one of the first things done was to restore the, to them the Sabbath, spoken of not as a new institution, but as a well-known institution. The Bible said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But I implore you, esteemed members of the jury, to consider the weight of the, the history and the echoes of faith that resonate through the ages. For centuries, the Sabbath has stood as a testament to unwavering devotion of believers, a day set apart by the very hand of God himself. Are we to believe that the apostles charged with safeguarding the teachings of our Lord would so callously cast aside this sacred institution? Indeed, the prosecution may point to Acts 20 verse 7 and 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1 and 2 as evidence of their claims. Yet, can we truly accept that these passages, fraught with ambiguity and interpretation, serves as a mandate to forsake the commandments of old? 
Shall we disregard the countless souls who have found solace and strength in the observance of the Sabbath, casting their faith aside like chaff in the wind? Furthermore, let us not forget the solemn words of our Savior himself, who declared, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come to, not to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5, verse 17. Would he who upheld the law with unwavering devotion condone such a reckless departure from its sacred precepts? Regarding these statements, there is nothing in Matthew 16, 19 to show that the apostles were delegated to do anything else than to teach the word of God. That text itself ought to be explained by the great commission given in Matthew 28, in which Jesus told his disciples to teach all things he had commanded them, but he never commanded them any of them or any change of the Sabbath. On the contrary, he declared that not one jot nor a tittle of the law could be changed. As we navigate this tumultuous water of this legal battle, let us hold fast to the beacon of truth that guides us. Let us not be swayed or by the serene songs of convenience, but instead let us stand firm in our conviction to uphold the sanctity of the Sabbath for generations to come. For it is upon this rock of faith that the pillar of justice shall find their strength and the light of truth shall shine bright for all to see. Thank you. The court will now have five minutes recess. We have a high priest up in heaven, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, he's our defender before the Father. Up 
in heaven he makes provision for me in the sanctuary at the mercy seat in the holy of holies in the holy of holies we meet he's blotting us session now resumes. Is the prosecution ready to present its case? Thank you, Your Honor. The prosecution would like to call the first witness to the stand. Please raise your right hand with me. Will you please raise your right hand with me? Take the oath. Do you swear, sorry, do you promise that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Tell the court in detail about the change of the Sabbath and who did it. It is no secret. The Catholic Church claims to have transferred the sacredness of the seventh-day Saturday Sabbath to Sunday. The Catholics do not accept the Bible as the only rule of faith. Besides the Bible, we have the living church as a guide. We say this church instituted by Christ to teach and to guide men through life has the right to change the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament and hence we accept our change of the Sabbath to Sunday. We frankly say yes, the church made this change, made this law as she made many other laws. For example, the unmarried priesthood, the law concerning mixed marriages, and a thousand other laws. By the way, what difference does it make? At least I'm taking a day to worship the Lord. The Sabbath is done away with. We have, the Old Testament is done away with. The Sabbath, the Sabbath is from the past. Testament now. We have the New Testament now. Order, order in the court. What more evidence do you want? 
Your Honor, the Sabbath is done away with. Prosecutor, if you have any more outbursts, you will be charged. The court will now have a short break.
This court is now resumed. Court case file number seven of the state versus Seven Day Adventist young people. The court will now have the defense. Members of the jury, we have no record that the apostle ever kept the first day of the week as a holy day. Acts, Acts 20 verse 7 record a night meeting held at the beginning of the first day of the week. The rest of the day was spent in, in a regular secular labor. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2 does not indicate a gathering, but that each man should lay by himself at home on the first day of the week. As God has prospered him, the money he would send to the needy in Judea so that it could be gathered when the apostle came. Objection, Your Honor. This is taken out of context. Overruled. Defense, are there any other further statements? Yes, Your Honor. If you think about it, isn't it funny that the Protestants who profess to go by the Bible and the Bible alone are demanding Sunday observance and are trying to prompt up Sunday law? Catholics find it laughable because there is no scriptoria, scriptoria support for this stand. The component missing from their reasoning is that God bless and sanctify the day, not the rest. God's, def get God's definition of keeping a day holy is to cease all secular work, Exodus 20, verse 8 through to 11. Refrain from buying and selling, Nehemiah 10, Nehemiah 10, verse 30, and 13 through to 15. And to focus on him and ho as our delight rather than worldly pleasure, Isaiah 58, 13 to 14. Prosecution. The prosecution would like to call our second witness to the stand. Yes. To the peace, take your right hand and take the oath. Do you promise that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Witness. On which day do you see most people around the world worship? On Sunday. Can you recall any major business Sunday? No. No further questions, Your Honor. Defense. Witness. Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, I used to be. But now I have a new study that the Sabbath was nailed to the cross and that Pope Constantine changed the Sabbath to Sunday. Can you prove that from the Bible that the day of worship was changed from Sabbath to Sunday? Mm, no. Your Honor, ladies of the juror, there is but one Bible Sabbath that instituted and commanded of God and observed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Your Honor, we would like to submit from the Bible as our evidence that Sabbath is the day of worship and not Sunday. Also, for all those who are present to note the evidence from the following text. Exodus 31, 13, Luke 4, 16, Mark 2, 28 to 20, 27 to 28, Luke 23, verses 52 to 56, Matthew 28, verse 1, Mark 16, 1 to 2, and 9. Should I go on? Mark 15, verse 42, and I can go on. It is interesting to note that after the crucifixion, these devoted disciples of Christ first rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Luke 23, verse 57. Although they were anxious to anoint Jesus' dead body with spices and fragrant oils, they waited from late Friday afternoon to early Sunday morning to return to his grave. They knew the Sabbath commandment wasn't abolished at the cross. I can't believe it. Are these texts in the Bible? 
It's the first I've seen this text revealed to me and not mentioned that, um, that the Catholics have changed the day of worship for their purpose. The courtroom buzzes with anticipation as the weight of the testimony settles in. The defense team prepares to further reinforce their argument. Your Honor, with your permission, we would like to call upon an expert in biblical history to shed some more light on the origins of Sabbath observance and its significance. Granted, let the expert witness be called to the stand. Test. 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 Okay. Please raise your right hand with me to take the oath. Do you promise that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Witness. Happy Sabbath. Certainly, the Sabbath. Can you provide us with historical context regarding the Sabbath and its observance? Certainly. The Sabbath has its roots in the creation narrative, where God rested on the seventh day and sanctified it as a day of rest. This divine commandment was reiterated in the giving of the Ten Commandments, where the seventh day Sabbath was specifically set apart for rest and worship. Is there any evidence to suggest that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday? No. There is no biblical or historical evidence to support, to support such a change. The shift from Saturday to Sunday observance occurred gradually over centuries, influenced by various socio-political factors rather than scriptural mandate. I thank you. Your Honor and esteemed jury, based on the expert testimony and the evidence presented, it is clear that the Saturday Sabbath is the day of worship established by God and observed by his faithful throughout history. Thank the you. The courtroom atmosphere is charged with a sense of revelation and contemplation as the truth of Sabbath observance is laid bare. The court will now recess for 10 minutes to allow the jury to reflect on the testimonies and ev evidence presented. Yeah. 
places And I've seen a lot of faces But there are times that I felt so all alone oh. But in my lonely hour Yes, in those lonely hours Jesus let me know I am his own Through it all Through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God Through it all Through it all I've learned to depend upon his words so I thank God for the mountains and I thank him for the valley and I thank him for the storms he's brought me through and I find in have a problem I never know my God could solve them I never know what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all. Court is now in session. The prosecution may proceed with their arguments. Uh, Your Honor, esteemed jury members, while it is true that this has not been a great start to this trial for the prosecution, I implore you to keep an open mind. We have seen the unity that the transition has provided to our faith community worldwide, and that is all the evidence that we need. Your Honor, may I request a moment to address a crucial point? Proceed, but be mindful of the time constraints. Thank you, Your Honor. I would like to draw attention to a critical aspect overlooked by the pro in the prosecution's argument. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus himself said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Indeed, but that does not negate the changes instituted by divine authority post-resurrection. Respectfully, Your Honor, the prosecution's assertion contradicts the word of our Lord. If we believe that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, then we must also acknowledge that his fulfillment does not nullify the Sabbath commandment, but rather affirms its enduring significance. An intriguing point raised by the defense. Prosecution, do you have a rebuttal? Your Honor, while we acknowledge the depth 
of scripture, we must consider the practical implications and adaptations necessary for a dynamic faith community. Your Honor, may I cite Exodus 31, 16 and 17, where God declares, Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations, as a covenant forever. It is a sign... Be it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. An intriguing scriptural reference indeed. Prosecution, do you have any conclusive arguments to counter this? Your Honor, the prosecution will take a moment to reassess and provide a more thorough response. Very well. The court will adjourn momentarily to allow the prosecution time to reflect. In the brief recess, the courtroom buzzes with anticipation as the persecution re-evaluates re its stance in the light of the scriptural challenge posed by the defense. Order in the court, order. The case before us is crucial touching upon every fiber of our beliefs. Let us proceed with reverence and diligence. Your Honor, esteemed members of the jury, I stand here to uphold the sanctity of Sunday as the day of worship. Our traditions, our history, and the very essence of our faith are intertwined with this day. And yet, Your Honor, the scriptures themselves testify to the sacredness of the seven-day Sabbath. The Sabbath, the form, from the dawn of creation, it was set apart by God, a day of rest and spiritual rejuvenation. But times change, Your Honor. We must adapt and embrace the new light that shines upon us. Sunday, the day of resurrection, symbolizes renewal and grace. Respectfully, Your Honor, the change of... The change of the Sabbath to Sunday was not ordained by divine decree, but by decisions of men. Our faith must rest on the unchanging truths of God's word. The, in Daniel 7.25, it says, And think to change times and laws. We cannot ignore the weight of tradition and the unity it brings to our community. Sunday observance has been a pillar of our worship for centuries. Yet, Your Honor, tradition alone cannot supersede the commandments of God. The Sabbath stands as a memorial of his creation and a sign of his covenant with his people. The arguments presented are compelling on both sides. Let us pause for a moment of reflection and seek guidance from the scriptures. Isaiah 58, 13 to 14. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable by not doing your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to the feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The words of Isaiah remind us of the reverence and joy that comes from honoring the Sabbath. Let us proceed with the closing arguments. In closing, I urge the jury to consider the unity and tradition that Sunday observance brings to our faith. 
let us not be divided by, but united in worship. And in closing, Your Honor, I implore the jury to uphold the divine commandments, to stand firm on the foundation of truth found in the scriptures. Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11 is still relevant and still stands today and will stand forever. The seventh day Sabbath is not a relic of the past, but a timeless testament to God's sovereignty. The jury has deliberated and their verdict is clear. The seventh day Sabbath, as outlined in the scriptures, remains the true day of worship. Let us let this trial serve as a reminder of the importance of studying God's word and remain, remaining faithful to his commandments. As the judge delivers the verdict, Judge delivers the verdict. Tensions rise in the courtroom. Some nod in agreement, while others murmur in disbelief. Suddenly, a member of the congregation stands up, his voice echoing through the room. Your Honor, may I speak? Proceed with caution. I cannot stay silent. The Sabbath is not just a day. It's a covenant between God and his people. We cannot let the traditions of men overshadow the divine commandments. Order. This is an outrage. Your Honor, I request that the, this member be allowed to express his views. It's a matter of conscience and conviction. Very well. You may continue, but maintain the quorum. Friends, fellow believers, I urge you to search your hearts and minds. The Sabbath is not bound by human laws or traditions. It is a gift from God, a day of rest and spiritual renewal. Let us not forget its significance amidst, amidst the noise of the world. The courtroom erupts in murmurs and contemplation as the profound words sink in. The participants and observers depart with a renewed sense of reverence and commitment to their faith. The echo of the Sabbath's defense lingering in their thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies of the jury, I am now going to read to you the law that you must follow in deciding this case to prove that the seven day sabbath is a true day of worship and not sunday the catholic extension magazine 180 wabash avenue chicago illinois under the blessing of pope pius the 12 and it reads Dear Sir, regarding the change from the observance of the Jewish Sabbath to the Christian Sunday, I wish to draw your attention to the facts. One, that Protestants who accept the Bible as the only rule of faith and religion should by all means go back to the observance of the Sabbath. The fact that the, they do not, but on the contrary, observe Sunday, stultifies them in the eyes of every thinking man. Two, we also say that of all Protestants, the Seventh-day Adventists are the only group that reasons correctly and are consistent with their teachings. It is always somewhat laughable to see Protestant churches in the pulpit and legislature demand the observance of Sunday, of which there is nothing in the Bible. Both the prosecution and the defense have made, now rested their cases. The attorneys will now present their final arguments. Prosecution, you may begin. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies of the jury, although the defense has put up a strong case, what difference does it make? At least we're worshiping God. The Bible says in Ephesians, 4 verse 5, one God, one faith, 
and one baptism. I could provide quotes from the historical literature of nearly all Sunday keeping Protestant organizations that confess there is no scripture to support Sunday observance. Bible scholars of every denomination who studied the Sabbath issue agreed to the sacred name of the seventh day is Sabbath. The fact is clear and requires no argument. Ladies of the jury, after all the evidence and statements admitted, you must make your decision. The jurors have deliberated and have reached a verdict. Have you have reached a verdict? The verdict by unanimous decision is the seventh day Sabbath is truly the Bible Sabbath, which is still binding, and that the Catholics have changed the day of worship to Sunday. We thank the juror for their hard work and all the participants in the program. I implore all of us to continue to study God's words and to know the truth for ourselves, that when the national Sunday law shall pass, we will remain loyal to our God. As we stand firmly up on his words, do the heavens fall. Court has now adjourned, all rise. Honorable judge departing. Contentment in my father's house today. Lots of food on his table. No one is turned away. There is singing and laughter as the hours pass by. Comes the singing as the father sadly cries. My house is full, but my fields is empty. Who will go and work for me? Today, it seems my children all want to stay around my table, and no one wants to work in my to work in my feet. Push away from that 
table look out through the window pane just beyond this house of plenty lies a field of golden grain and it's ripen unto harvest but the reapers where are they they're in the house oh can't his children hear the feather sadly sing my house is full but my fields is empty who will go and work for me today It seems my children, oh, they want to stay around my table. And no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Lord, forgive us, we will work in your Testing. Uh, there we go. Uh, good evening, everyone. Did you enjoy that little um, dramatization that we just did? Uh, it does sound like enjoy. But, but I did enjoy it. And what we're about to do now, we're, we're about to give everybody the opportunity to, to take part in what just happened a while ago. So we're going to have a Perfect. brief discussion. And we'll, be not take, we'll not take everybody. Unfortunately. Yes, we won't take everybody. We'll just take a few of the hands as we ask a few questions and as we provide the answers as best as possible. So I ask that you be as comp comprehensive as possible and using the shortest possible time to get your points across, all right? So reflecting on the courtroom drama portrayal of the Sabbath versus Sunday debate, what are your thoughts and yours? on the role of tradition versus spiritual truth in religious practices, and how can individuals and religious communities balance these aspects effectively? What right, are your so thoughts? Before I ask, before I take the hands, uh, you know, the truth be told is that we're living in a world that it's so easy for tradition to take the high seat, especially in our churches, but as it regards to something as important as the Sabbath, the Bible is clear, and it, it, it's clear where it says that tradition, God does not follow the tradition of men. The Bible says that God has his own tradition. And in fact, we're reminded in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, where Jesus had to talk to somebody, the scribes and Pharisees. He says, in vain do you worship worship me keeping for tradition the doctrines of men so as it regards to the sabbath it's not built on tradition but what the bible actually says and let's just point that out or make it clear that jesus's tradition and god's tradition came from creation before the tradition of men all right so regardless of any other tradition let us follow the tradition that came first yeah, and that, that's, that's very true. So we ought, we ought to be careful that we don't 
fall in the place where we are following the, we're following the tradition of men because there's a lot of tradition going around especially as it comes as it regards to sabbath keeping and some of these things that we do are not necessarily bible right so we are asking how can we effectively strike a balance with our traditions and the traditions of the bible or god's traditions especially regarding Sabbath observance. Floor is now open for questions. Questions. Well, taking or responses. Answers, rather. Yeah. Don't uh, go at all at once, people. All right, Don't go all at once. All right, go ahead, my brother. Can I speak? Um, no. You step away from the box. Oh. Right. So, um, as it regards um, striking, first of all, when it comes to um, striking a balance, there's no balance. Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. So if we're going to strike a balance between our will and God, we're already going on the wrong road. Let me just start there. So his will, you know, has to take precedence. But one thing I noticed, though, um, in, the, in the play, that we have to be very, very careful of in terms of when we're talking about defending the Sabbath, because, I mean, the defense, and I know the church is, you know, biased towards the defense. I know this, I am too. But... We made, we made an argument about the, Sabbath be, be, uh, about the Sabbath being a side between God and Israel. We, I think we should shy away from the Israel argument. If God, we do that, first we will then say the Sabbath was binding, but binding on the Jews and not on Christians. We should stay away from that argument and stress on the creation aspect of the argument. Because when they stress it about creation, then it's binding on everybody. That's the best way to defend it. Once it's talking about, you know, giving to Israel or binding up on a side between God and Israel, we're going down a rabbit hole that can be poked by persons who are saying we are more Jews than we are Christians. And we don't want that to be because the Jews reject Jesus. We are the true worshippers of Christ. We honor Christ. So don't, you know, stress too much on the Israel part. Keep away from that and talk about the Sabbath between being a sign of God as the creator. Amen, amen. Well said, my brother. I see a, I see a hand there. But we might have to use those hands for the other part of the discussion based on time. So I'm going to go now to question two. The courtroom drama highlighted the tension between tradition and spiritual truth regarding Sabbath observance. How do you think modern day religious communities navigate this tension, especially considering history and cultural influences? So I'm sure we were, we, we, some, some of us must have been met with um, segregation and seclusion when, you know, we, we said that we are seven day Adventists. And usually it doesn't come from persons who are not affiliated with any um, denomination. But it usually comes from those who are from or another denomination, usually observing Sunday. How do we navigate? I, I, I see a hand over there before I see what I have to say. The mic is behind you. Okay. Oh, All right. Hold on, Sister Natasha. He was, he was first. All right, hold on, my brother. Sister Natasha will go first. Go ahead, Sister Natasha. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, how do we navigate um, this thing between tradition and God's laws? First thing, um, it begins with the mindset of the believer. Traditions are things that vary. God's law is a standard. It never changes. And while we interact with persons who might not be of our faith, the thing is, or what I find is, own the Sabbath. Own it. It's yours. We tend to hear persons saying, oh, um, for your Sabbath, I'm my Sabbath. But still own the Sabbath. But it's, it's a part of your covenant. You identify with it. The Bible says that we must be ready to give. Everyone that asks a reason for what we believe. And we can gently and lovingly express 
the joy that we get from observing the Sabbath and how we hold on to the promise that Jesus has, that God has sent his son Jesus. And this is the reason why we celebrate these things. These things are memorials. These things are standard. So we can own it and use the opportunity to gently educate those who might think it's just a day and I'm worshiping God. And let them see the significance that we are a covenant keeping people and the importance of the covenant that we are a part of. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll just take uh, your, uh, my brother over there, I'll take your point real quick. All right, thank you so much. Um, happy Sabbath, everyone. There's, there's two things. You have preference and you have principles. Just as how you have tradition and you have the commandments. Now, in preferences, you can do anything, choose anything. But when it What's comes to principle, you cannot just like the commandments with tradition, you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to God's law, his commandments, mm -hmm. you have to do what he says. Amen. And so it is very easy for us to spot the truth versus the lie. Because everything that God has set up, the devil has set up something beside it. Amen. Amen. And, um, on just, that, and on that note, we'll wrap up everything by... Excuse me, before you wrap up, I have a pressing point to make. And I think it's of integral importance that I make the point. And um, I just found it ironic that both individuals that spoke said something that is directly linked to the point that I was about to make. Earlier, you both alluded to the principles of Christ being traditions, and it should not be so. In fact, traditions are the transmission of customs and beliefs. The principles of the Bibles should be referred to as instituted principles, but not tradition or God's tradition. So we need to be careful when we're referring to the principles of the Bible that we should be enforcing as traditions, which is the way of the world, but instituted, meaning that they originated with Christ and were set for us to abide by. Amen. And Amen. Thank, thank you for that, that lovely point, my sister. All right, so just to wrap up everything, you know, it, we realize that the Sabbath is, is a part of the Ten Commandments, meaning that it is binding. It, it is in the very foundation of God's love. And the Bible says that God does not change, and neither does his words. So because the Sabbath is, is tied up in the Ten Commandments, it does not change, and it will not change. Regardless of how the times change, how culture change, the word of God stands firm. It will not change. And the Sabbath will always remain as the, the fourth day. The seventh day, I'm sorry. The seventh day. The fourth the seventh commandment, day. my brother. Yes, the fourth commandment and the seventh day. But the Sabbath does not change people. And God does not change likewise. So regardless of the, the traditions, God does not change. Amen. And he is... The binding agent in the Ten Commandments. Amen. Amen. And thank you for participating. This brings us to the end of our AY program. I'm glad you were engaged. I'm glad you were bubbling with answers and, and responses. And thank you again for participating. We'll now turn over to the persons responsible for Vespa. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath, visiting friends. Today was a good day, amen? Come on, given what we learned in AY. What we learned in AY, the Sabbath has been good, amen? I don't know about you, but the Sabbath has given me rest. The Sabbath has satisfied my hunger, quenched my thirst, it provided inspiration and restoration. Sabbath gave me a renewed hope and a recommitted purpose. Amen? So today has been a good day. Amen. <laughs> For the few moments we have together, I want to share with you a key to happiness, just one. 
Uh, turn your Bibles with me to Genesis 45. It's Genesis 45, verses 14 and 15. Genesis 45, verses 14 and 15. It says, And he, referring to Joseph, fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed him, kissed all his brethren, and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Let the church say, Amen. The result of forgiveness is that his brethren talked with him. Augustone District, the result of forgiveness is that relationships are restored. I don't think you heard me. Hope District, the result of forgiveness is that happiness is experienced. Amen. If we are to experience happiness in our relationships, we must forgive. And if we are to experience happiness in our relationship with God, we must forgive. Therefore, let us accept God's forgiveness and extend it to others so that together we will experience true happiness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your voice. Speak now, for we hear. So pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Three mean-looking men on motorcycles pulled into a truck stop cafe where a truck driver, a little guy, was sitting at a counter, quietly eating his lunch. The three thugs saw him grabbed his food and laughed in his face. But the truck driver didn't say a word. He got up, paid for his food, and walked out. One of the bikers, unhappy that they weren't able to provoke the little man into a fight, bragged to the waitress. He sure wasn't much of a man, was he? The waitress replied, no, I guess not. Then glancing out the window, she added, I guess he's not much of a truck driver either. He just ran over those three motorcycles. <laughs> there is a popular belief that you should not get mad, just get even. And that seems to be the world's philosophy of how to deal with someone who wrongs you. Basically, the mantra is, anything you do me, I'm going to do your back. If you steal from me, I will steal from you. If you lie to me, I will lie to you. If you start a rumor about me, I'm going to start a bigger rumor about you. And if you cheat on me, I will cheat with your best friend. That is the world's way. But God prescribes another way. Amen. God's principle is contained in Ephesians 4, verse 32. He says we are to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven us. That is the principle that Joseph applied. See, I don't know about you, but I believe Joseph's act of forgiveness is one of the most difficult to pattern. It is easy to read his story, but hard to apply. Yet this is what God calls us to do, to offer forgiveness to our fellow men. Amen? For the sake of our visitors, we will quickly review Joseph's story. Joseph was a second of 12 sons born to Jacob. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. The situation was made worse when Joseph shared his dreams that his brother would someday bow to him. One day, Joseph traveled to check on his brothers while they were watching their sheep. His brothers plotted against him, threw him in an empty well, and later sold him as a slave to some Midianites. They then made Jacob believe his son had been killed by wild animals. 
Joseph was taken to Egypt and sold to Potiphar as a household slave. Joseph was later falsely accused of attempting to rape Potiphar's wife, and he was thrown in prison. While in prison, Joseph accurately interpreted the dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants, who were also incarcerated. Later, Pharaoh had a disturbing dream, and Joseph was eventually summoned from prison to interpret it. The Pharaoh was so impressed by Joseph that he appointed him the second in command over Egypt. Pharaoh's dream had predicted seven years of famine. During the famine, Joseph's older brothers came to Egypt to buy food. They did not recognize Joseph, now 20 years older, and he treated them harshly, pretending that he thought they were spies. After a series of twists and turns that included his brothers bowing before him in fulfillment of his dreams, Joseph revealed, him to, revealed himself to his brothers. And this is where we pick up in our scripture reading. The New International Version says, Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. What an incredible image of forgiveness, an embrace and a kiss. Having almost been killed by his brothers, persons he loved and trusted, persons with whom he ate and slept, persons with whom he sang on the choir, persons with whom he had Bible study, persons with whom he shared his Sabbath afternoon lunch, having had these persons sell him into slavery, having had to spend time in an Egyptian prison because of these persons, Joseph forgave them. He held his arms wide open as a sign of his forgiveness and he embraced them. Who do you need to embrace in forgiveness? What unforgiven situation is robbing you of true happiness? Let us accept God's forgiveness and extend it to others so that together we will experience true happiness. You see, forgiveness is not something that is readily promoted in our world. We often read in stores that sells plates or other fragile merchandise. We read signs that says if you break it, you pay for it. That is a sign that the world puts up. That is a sign that human beings often put up in stores of our lives. Basically, we advertise that I am fragile, I am delicate, I am sensitive, I am proud, I am stubborn, I am I am wounded, I am hurt, and if you break a part of me, you're going to pay for it. But God has a different sign, amen? Uh, he has a better sign. Uh, Susan Williams tells us how she tiptoed through a gift shop filled with hundreds of extremely fragile items displayed on glass shelves. Pausing to admire one, she strained to see much of the details because she did not want to touch it. Suddenly, a female voice behind her said, please, pick it up if you like. Don't worry, she said with a smile. You can rely on our store policy. And she pointed to a sign on the display case that read, if you break it, please tell us so we can forgive you. That is God's sign. God has put up a huge sign. It is Jesus on the cross and the sign reads, if you break it, please tell me so I can forgive you. When we've broken God's commandments, when we, we've shattered relationships, when delicate feelings are damaged, when peace has cracked into divisiveness, when unity is split into discord, when families are fractured, when 
our faith is crumbling, that is the time to turn to God for forgiveness. Because in him we can find happiness. In him we can find peace and joy, unity and love. Brothers and sisters, visiting friends, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is willing to give us the key to happiness. And all he asks is that we forgive others. Will you forgive that person today? So Joseph had every reason to be upset with his brothers. Yet he extended to them an embrace. Instead of judging or hurting them in return, he forgave them. Yet we find in Genesis 50 that the brothers were still unsure that they had been forgiven. After their father died, they began to question, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for the wrong that we've done him? In chapter 45, Joseph had forgiven his brothers. Yet in chapter 50, they were begging for forgiveness they already received. Unforgive us. Unforgiveness makes us miserable and unhappy. You see, the uncertainty of their forgiveness was a reflection of the brother's character than it was of Joseph's. I believe they were thinking if someone had done to them what they did to Joseph, they would not have forgiven them so easily. I believe they were saying that had my brother sought to kill me, I would seek to kill him, not to feed him. I believe they were thinking had my brother sold me as a slave, I would make him my slave, not liberate him. They were perhaps thinking if my brother caused me to be imprisoned, I would arrest him, not set him free. Forgiveness had been extended, but their own conscience made it hard to accept it. So they were miserable and unhappy. They had not, had, they had not accepted the key to happiness. Think about that for a minute. How often does God extend his forgiveness to us only to have us question it? How often does he wipe the slate clean of promiscuity but we still view ourselves as unclean? How often does he remove the charge of lying from me but I still walk around with the shame, miserable and unhappy? It is time we remember that who the sun sets free free indeed it is time we accept the key to happiness forgiveness is a miracle of grace in which the offense no longer separates this was realized with Joseph and his brothers his forgiveness of his brothers was a miracle of grace and in, in which the evil they did no longer separated them from each other virgin and friends forgiveness means that will not use the offense as a weapon against someone else. Forgiveness means that the power of love that holds us together is greater than the power of the offense that separates us. In forgiveness, we are releasing our offenders so that they are no longer bound to us. In a very real sense, we are freeing them to receive God's grace. And we are freeing ourselves to experience happiness. You have been hurt. And you are finding it hard to forgive. But it's time to offer that person forgiveness. He walked out on you and the children. But it's time to forgive him. She fought you out of getting the promotion. But it's time to forgive her. They behaved as if they were better than you. But it's time to forgive them. He robbed you of your innocence. But... It's time to forgive him. She never supported your dream. She made you feel inferior to others. But it's time to forgive her. Yes, the pain is great. And it feels hard to let go. But it's time to offer forgiveness. It shows us how happy we can be. The picture of Joseph and his brother shows how beautiful 
forgiveness can be. It shows us how happy we can be. Therefore, let us accept God's forgiveness and extend it to others so that together we will experience true happiness. Amen. We're going to stand at this time with our hymnals turned to hymn 334. Come thou fount of every blessing. close heavenly father and our god we thank you for your gifts we thank you for your love we thank you for your benevolence we thank you for being a good god heavenly father the sabbath day has truly been a day of rest and gladness and for that we thank you and now lord as we would have heard your words from morning until now we are encouraged that uh, the keys to happiness can be ours if we surrender ourselves to you. Lord, we know of ourselves we are prone to wonder. We know of ourselves we are prone to, to not forgive others. To, we are prone to hate, to, to, to self-destruct. But Lord, even now, we are giving over our lives to you. Here's our heart. Take and seal it. Seal it, Lord, so that we can be counted in a number that will hail you and Lord and Savior when you return. Be with us, your people, seeking daily to persevere in this walk with you. Lord, we recognize, young people told us, that the Sabbath being a memorial of your creative power is also a sign of your redemption. And so, Lord, as we come in obedience on the Sabbath day, help us to, to share with others that we're doing it in obedience because we know you're a God who creates, but a God who redeems. We know you're a God who saves. So help us, Lord, to leave this space renewed in our conviction that you're God all by yourself. Renewed in your conviction that as children of God, we ought to serve you. As children of God, we need to reach others so that they can taste of your goodness. Help us, Lord, to renew this conviction so that as we leave here, we will leave rejoicing, but not just that, Lord, but we will come bringing in the sheaves so that they too can rejoice. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, indeed. What a Sabbath, Elder Cousins. Yes, yes ma'am. What a Sabbath. It, if today was a blessing for you, let me hear you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 
Amen. If you are going to be taking a friend and a family tomorrow night, let me hear you say hallelujah. Which means that all these chairs are we seen. Full. Full tomorrow. Full. Because full. Full. a no. promise listen. has been made. The angels would have recorded that. Yes. So listen, you can't go back on your word. Tomorrow night is going to be unbelievable. 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 And that's, that's a topic for tomorrow. That's a, that, that's a topic. <laughs> yes. It's unbelievable. You want to know what's unbelievable? You have to be here you tomorrow night. You have to night. be here tomorrow night. Yes. To with, find somebody. Out. with somebody. Yes. With somebody. Amen. With somebody. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before you go. The first one is... Let's remember that we have a transportation system it's specific to the Keys to, Eva Keys to Happiness evangelistic series. Wherever you might be coming from, there's a bus coming from that direction. So you just need to talk with your elders, talk with... Uh, there's a particular person in your church responsible for transportation. It's free. Absolutely free to for our visiting friends. Free right. to our visiting friends. But and what just about the members? One hundred dollars. Just a hundred dollars. Just a hundred dollars. Amen. Just a hundred dollars. Also, save the date, April seventh. What's happening on the seventh of April? Hell. There. Let me let me give them a clue. Hellfair. You guys shout it now. Ask them again. What's happening on the seventh of April? Hellfair. Right, and it's absolutely <laughs> free. I'm pretty sure that I've said that every night. Is it that the persons who are here now are no, not here ask nightly? them again. Ask them again and they're going to tell you. No, no, no. What's happening on the 7th of April? Yeah. And it's absolutely... Yeah. Awesome job. So that means you're going to ensure that everybody that you know comes out on the 7th of April. Amen. So the 7th of April is a very busy day. It's a very busy day. Very, very but busy by day. by God's grace, I should be here in Amen. the afternoon. Let's remember also that the talk shop is open every single night. If you have been loving the soup, let me hear you say praise the Lord. Soup. <laughs> the soup, the soup, soup has soup. been absolutely delicious each night. And we want to thank the hospitality team for that. Come out in support of the talk shop that is open each night. Remember, we have said it before and we're saying it again. It takes cash to care. Yes. And I know some persons are busy during the day. You have to go to work. But guess what? We do have some Bible counselors on the ground. And we have other persons who are here in the nights when you're comfortably in your bed. There are persons here who are Working watching the, field, yes. the, the, the equipment. Yes, there are security. persons who are out in the sun. Yeah. There are persons who have to go back so and many forth. Things plugged in, there electricity. Are <laughs> so we need Amen. some funds. So this is our reminder to tell you that whatever you have, it doesn't have to be a million dollars, although we'd, we'd, we'll take we'd, that we'd too. Take we'll that. take the million. We'll right. take that. <laughs> but if you don't have a million dollars, we will take what you give because you can't beat God's giving. No matter how you try. Amen. So I want you to try this week. What a rate of If you know somebody that can make a donation, yes, yeah. make a call. Yeah, if you need a, a letter call. for your workplace, we'll write that letter for you. Whatever wherever it the is, contribution is coming from. We need those donations Amen. to ensure that this series will be as impactful as it can and will run smoothly through the period Amen. of Amen. time. We see you tomorrow night. We see you tomorrow night beginning at 7 sharp all the way up to Thursday. Tomorrow night but, all but, the way but, through but to Thursday. Second, Ella, I mm -hmm. feel like I need a new tablet, but I don't have any money to buy it. I need a new tablet. You need a new tablet? I need a new tablet, but I don't have any money to buy it. Is there something that I can do? To yes. There are prizes in store for persons who take the challenge and bring out many of their friends, family and friends. So I just need to go through my phone book and see how many persons I can, can invite get, oh, this yes. week. The evangelist and then by has, the end of the I week, I have tablets. a new tablet. Yes, 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 yes. All right. Okay. Anybody wants a new tablet? All right, the challenge is on. So the challenge is on. Invite your family, invite your friends. Yes. We have tablets, we have books. To give away. We have a lot of gifts. And we, don't, we, we want to encourage you. Yes. So invite them out. And remember, tomorrow night is the award ceremony for our quizzers. Amen. So if you know that you would have won, if you're From sure that week, you won yes. last week, Come there on is tomorrow. something for everybody Amen. that would have won at least one night. Amen. I am very generous, guys. Amen. I am very generous. <laughs> so if you would have won so at least... It's not just for the whole week, just one night. Here's the thing, just a hint. 
we had at least 37 persons winning one night. Amen. And Amen. then there were seven persons who won at least the whole two nights. Oh, okay, wow, okay. And then we do have one very special person who won all night. Amen. So if I you want, want to know, to know who, who those is. persons are, yes. come tomorrow, and if you want to see what they're getting, Come tomorrow, yes. and if your name should be called the following week, come all week, come tomorrow. Just come and participate. Amen. And don't forget to invite persons with you. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the night. Amen. See you all tomorrow. Tomorrow night at 7. The keys to happiness evangelistic impact. Have a blessed evening, everyone. Be good. Again and again, sweep away the dark.